welcome to uh, today's Lohan webinar. Uh, it's CJ from Lohan Academy. So today we are very happy to have Professor Lian Yang from University of Toronto to talk about open banking with deposit and monitoring. So Professor uh, Lian Yang uh, is a professor of finance and chair in investment strategy at the Rotman School of Management, University of Toronto, and his research interests are in financial market, asset pricing, and behavioral finance. He's currently serving on the um, as an associate editor at the uh, Journal of Economic Theory, Journal of Finance, among other leading journals. And also he has received numerous prizes, uh, including the 2016 uh, JFQA William Sharp Award for the scholarship in financial research, and 2016 Bank of Canada Governors Award, and 2015 Roger Martin Award for the excellence in research. So uh, without further ado, um, please join me to welcome uh, our speaker today, uh, Professor Li Yang. Um, you will have about 90 minutes. Um, please take it over. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, CJ. I'm going to share my screen with you. Mm. Thank you very much for having me here uh, to present my work. Uh, this paper is co-authored with Itai Goldstein and uh, Chung Huang. Itai is also in the audience and Chung is teaching now. Unfortunately, he cannot. Um, uh, participate in the, uh, the seminar. The uh, it is from voting. Chung uh, is from uh, UCI. I'm from uh, Toronto, and also both Itai and myself are affiliated with uh, Luohan Academy. So it's a it's a great honor to present the paper here. So the paper the, the title is called Open Banking with Depositor Monitoring. So we uh, started this project back in 2018 when we uh, kind of saw um, Canada uh, discussing. Um, bank, uh, open banking issues. Um, so uh, we paid attention to this kind of issue, follow up this issue for a long time, but the progress is a little bit slow. And only recently we got some kind of progress. And this is our first time to present the paper. And so any, any questions, uh, welcome. And the paper is still very preliminary now. So the paper sort of called about the open banking. Open banking is a, a very new concept, probably it's a, Precise definition still dynamic and developing, and then what it means might still kind of changing. Like in, in Canada, so initially it was called open banking, and now it's called consumer directed banking. So it's kind of uh, the, the name is still changing, but in our view, we think the two uh, of the uh, essential aspects of open banking are data control and the data sharing. Uh, if you think about open banking as a new concept, you can, you can compare this to the traditional banking uh, as a comparison. So the traditional banking, if you think about it now is open banking, traditional banking is called closed banking. In the closed banking, you, you have some banks, those banks have their own customers, like this is the bank, the customer, then they have kind of one-to-one -one relation. The basically the banks know the data of the consumers, of their borrowers, the depositors, they know all the data. So the banks sort of, like the monopoly of the data. And so they can use the data uh, to, uh, to get information and provide a service to consumers. But the banks is a monopoly of the data. The banks know the data of all the consumers. So open banking idea, so, so sort of is think about transfer the data ownership from the bank to the consumer and then allow the consumer to share the data across the different banks, like the, across the different institutions. So in, in this, from this perspective, so we think that this open banking idea is sort of, first of all, you transfer the data ownership from the bank institution to the um, consumer and the borrower, and then the borrower will share information across the different um, uh, banks. So that's kind of the two essential features we think that will capture open banking, data control and the data sharing. And our talk today will mainly focus on data sharing uh, aspect and the data control, I think is already kind of sort of covered by uh, the paper, by a recent working paper by uh, Zhi Guo Jing and, and Ji Dong. So that, that's kind of the big idea of our open banking. And so what's happening around, around the world is people are still debating about this idea. So, I, so we, we, we found this table to kind of divide the status according to two dimensions. The horizontal is uh, what the attitude of regulators, like a government or central banks, whether those government and the central banks are kind of enthusiastic about the open banking idea. So the vertical is about the market, so kind of the, the what about the, whether the market is kind of excited about the open banking idea. You can see if you are in this region, 
So both the, the you know, kind of the market and also regulators are very, very supportive of open banking. So here mainly kind of in, kind of UK and also the European countries, also Australia. Uh, so the kind of European countries, Germany, France, and the UK, and the USA is here. And China is in this range. China is kind of the, the regulation, not very keen about that, but it's some, somehow the kind of the, the, the market started to discuss about the open banking idea. So, so people still debate about the pros and the cons of open banking. So, well, so what, what's good and what's bad about the open banking idea? So, so in terms of the, in the US, um, in the US, open banking idea is, uh, if you think about the data sharing, is not uh, particularly kind of new. So, in, uh, so in, in the history, we have uh, data sharing about uh, credit scores, like FICO scores. Also, like in 2019, uh, FICO and the, and the other two companies that launched another kind of so-called ultra FICO score. And this is not, a, not only about the FICO scores, also about the bank account information. I think when Zhu Guo also presented a paper on open banking a few weeks ago, he talked about something about this part, kind of the history of open banking in the US. And there is some recent new development about open banking in the US. In particular, in Ju July 2021, um, Biden administration put out an order. So that order tried to promote the competition in the uh, American uh, banking industry. So in particular, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that order uh, sort of uh, kind of pushed the open banking idea. And we want to highlight one thing here is in this order, they also try to kind of um, uh, uh, push the idea that open banking will allow consumers, allow kind of borrowers to uh, switch their institutions more easily. So more like uh, retail shopping. So originally, probably you have to stick with your a relationship with bank because the bank know your data, you don't you you, you know the information, and now the information belongs to you. So you can carry this data to other banks and talk to other banks. This is more about kind of the the, the data sharing across the institution, allowing consumers to easily share information across the different institution institutions. And the, the motivation here is this will increase the competition among banks. So this idea is kind of very, very intuitive. It's also very, very similar to the initial argument by Canada. And according to, uh, uh, yes, uh, Inju, uh, no, sorry, sorry. Uh, CJ. I have the one question uh, regarding the uh, kind of the, uh, reality, how does this work in reality? I mean, if there's a lot of data for each individual consumers, then where does this, those data store? Um, so the story in the in the uh, like uh, personal uh, storage of the con individual consumer, or there are some kind of uh, open infra infrastructure. That's, yeah, that, uh, that's yeah, that, that, there's some discussion about the implementation, and I think now Canada is in the, at that stage of discussing the implement, implementation uh, uh, part. I think uh, in, in the history, like over the past two years, there are two ways. One is called something called API, the other one called the, the data scraping. And so you kind of like the data scraping, so you allow third institution to use their bank credentials. They know the bank credential, and then log into your bank account and get that information. Basically, you, uh, uh, that, that one is people talk about the cyber security is not very safe. And the API is probably safer. So you, you, it's kind of the banks will provide information to uh, a third party. So that, that, your, your bank, your relationship with bank. So that, that's some kind of, that, 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 that's, that's another issue about the implementation issue. So, so that's kind of involved with, with uh, cyber risk, data risk, these kind of things. Yeah, that's a, a, about the specific implementation. It is still developing, not uh, mature yet. Uh, so that, that, that's kind of the, the recent development in, in the US. Uh, so I, I mentioned that the, we really started this idea uh, when we kind of um, uh, see the, uh, saw the discussion in Canada. So the, the, in, in Canada, is, I follow this case very, very closely. Uh, so, and also the debate is very, very clean. So why there? So it's important people care about the about That's kind of very, very clean. So in 2018, the government started to consider over open banking and also appointed a committee to discuss open banking. The initial idea is very, very similar to the motivation by Biden administration uh, this July. So the idea that open banking will allow consumers to share data across uh, uh, banks so that the banks will compete more aggressively that can 
can, can reduce the monopoly power of your relationship with bank. So that can increase the welfare, so increase the borrower's welfare, the overall welfare. So that's the, in, the initial argument. And but the advisory, the, my committee, uh, very, very cautious. In, in, uh, in January 2019, they released a consultation paper, uh, write a paper to explain what open banking is, how it works, how it can benefit the society, and like uh, related to CGS question, how it is implemented now, and ask people, the, the general open public, basically academia, industry people, ask people to, 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 to ask what, what are, are their, their views and kind of whether they think open banking is good or bad. In particular, they think about the, the, the risk. They think although open banking might benefit the borrowers or uh, can reduce the monopoly power of relationship with bank, it might reduce the you know, overall welfare. But what kind of overall welfare will be reduced is not very clear. It just I start to think about there might be some hidden risk there, like a cyber risk, data risk, or, uh, or some kind of financial stability risk. Also, Bank of Canada is also very concerned about this issue. Also, think about the, what the open, if we implement open banking, what will happen to the financial stability? So whether that will kind of shock the entire financial system that will reduce the, value, the overall welfare, although it might increase borrower welfare because it reduces the power of your bank, it might reduce the overall welfare due to some unknown reasons, some unknown risk. So what we do in this paper specifically, we want to identify what that unknown risk is. If you think about that, there's some unknown risk discussed by those uh, those people in the general public, they think that something the first order. So what they are. And, and the last year, January, the committee recommended uh, kind of this open banking idea to the government. I think this is a good idea, we should go ahead. And they also changed the name from open banking to consumer direct finance, because they think open banking is somehow probably not uh, general enough or sometimes generated confusing concept. People don't know what open means. Open means leaking risk. I share my data with everyone. It's open. It's not, a, not, a, not, a, not a safe. So they, they, think, they think this consumer direct finance is a better or more precise description for this uh, concept. And I said, this, this concept is still dynamic. It's still evolving, developing, but we sort of know the history. And then the, they discuss the pros and the cons. In particular, they mentioned, they think among the discussions, they think these things are very important, the first order. They think about the uh, kind of privacy, uh, consumer protection, also think about the cybersecurity, and also think about the financial health or stability. And uh, so we, we, we only focus on one thing in this paper. So we, we focus on the financial stability part. We, we think about if you, you implement open banking, what will be the effect on the entire financial system about the financial stability, resource allocations. So how, how, how will that affect this uh, overall welfare? Intuitively, if you have open banking, that might increase overall welfare. This is just an intuitive argument also supported by those kind of, uh, uh, kind of Canada and the US argument. But academically, it's not necessarily true as what uh, you know, the, the paper by Zhigo Jing and uh, Ji Dong showed. In some cases, actually consumer welfare, borrower welfare can be reduced. So we, now we abstract away from that part. We move on to think about the suppose you even if it will increase borrower welfare, what will happen to the entire financial system? What will happen to the overall welfare? And we focus on uh, the so-called uh, so, so uh, two efficiency. One is called funding efficiency. The other one is called screening efficiency. Basically, we interpret this financial stability as a kind of efficient resource allocation following Admati's uh, uh, idea. So you, you can interpret this funding efficiency and the screening efficiency as a type of one, type, of, uh, type of two errors. So funding efficiency means if you, if the borrower is a high quality, it's a good product, this borrower should re receive more funds. So that, that's the, the, the higher the funding frequency efficiency, the, the better, given the borrower has a high uh, quality. So that, that the borrower should receive more funds. The screening efficiency is a, the, kind of the mirror image. So suppose the borrower had a low uh, credit, but the borrower had a low kind of the product is bad, so this borrower should not receive uh, fund. So we, we think about the, what, what's the interaction between funding efficiency, screening efficiency, and what will the impact on both of them and also on the overall. So that, that's kind of the, 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 uh, the, the background of the study. 
Um, before I move on, I want to see so whether uh, any questions or any hands raised. Okay, so if no no question, Shumio, uh, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, can I ask a question? Uh, yes. So when we talk about open banking, would, uh, would you think that it is uh, like a centralized system and uh, directed uh, directed or hi heavily influenced by the government, or is more like a decentralized system that the uh, each financial intermediation would decide whether to share their data and to serve their customers? Yeah, that, that's a good question. <clears throat> I, I think um, um, probably it's a decentralized. The data is controlled by the consumer, by the borrower. The borrower decides whether you want to share your data across a different um, institution, the financial institution, across the different banks. So that, that uh, so that's more like a decentralized. Uh, I, I think what you have in mind is a centralized, maybe something like a FICO. So you have a third party, the third party can uh, kind of monitor the information that the mo uh, on behalf of uh, con consumers and then decide to whether to share information. So here is, I think it's more decentralized, but in our, in our, in our paper, we didn't focus on that, we abstract away from that part. We focus more on the data sharing, uh, sharing result because in our model, uh, so those consumers, they want to share the information by construction. We, we kind of abstract away from data control part on purpose. We just want to focus on the other aspect, the data sharing. And then you think about the re reaction of the depositors. Uh, so that, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's what we do in the paper. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so and I said, so what do we do in the paper? Uh, so if you, if I want to use one sentence to summarize the result, it's, it's kind of like, um, we want to capture another essential feature of banking, which is uh, maturity mismatch. The maturity mismatch is captured by the depositor renegotiation. So when you have open banking, so those depositors will try to renegotiate with the banks and their renegotiation will raise the funding cost of banks, uh, of all banks. That's more like a systematic risk. Uh, raising, the, raising the funding cost of all banks, which in turn will amplify the vendor's curse problem. And so th this can, drive down the overall welfare. So we, we think this, uh, this can contribute to the debate of open banking, uh, about open banking. Like in the Canada case, so Canada government uh, think open banking can increase the borrower's welfare, but they are un, un, unsure, uncertain about what, what kind of risk hitting there that they can shake the entire financial system. So our uh, kind of, uh, our model or our setup, uh, shows that indeed open banking can increase borrower welfare, but because of the liquidity or the maturity mismatch feature, which is inherent in banking system, that can amplify vendors curse, which in turn can reduce overall welfare. So it can increase borrower welfare, but it can lower the entire welfare. So we, we think this sort of identify the financial stability constraint emphasized by uh, Canada uh, government. So that, that's the, Kind of the main finding of the paper. If you uh, the, the the model the setup is very much related to banking competition uh, literature. So we have we have a, a home bank. The home bank will have the borrower's data and use the data to generate a private signal about the borrower's quality. And then that a challenging bank, alternative bank. This bank does not have new information under the current system, banking system, but the this uh, bank, if had the information, can use its own algorithm to generate a different signal under the bank open banking system. And then the, in the open banking system, these banks will compete um, for um, borrowers by kind of offering different interest rate. The borrowers they will choose the, the, the bank with a lower interest rate and then uh, go with it. So the main innovation at that side of the model is um, to think about what the bank's depositor will react. So we think probably our paper, the first paper to think about the interaction among borrowers and the depositors and the banks among the three players. And the banks will, re, uh, the, the bank's depositor will react because of this maturity mismatch problem that their reaction will increase the funding costs of each bank, of all banks. So that can amplify the vendor's curse problem that can reduce the overall uh, kind of social welfare. So that's a kind of, we, we want to highlight one uh, economic insight 
the positive side of the vanguard curves will kind of change the vanguard curves. That will change the banking uh, competition and uh, affect the social welfare. That, that's kind of an overall insight. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, this is a question from somebody who is not in very much in the literature of banking. Probably you guys have thought about this uh, before. It seems to me the bank depositors are much less uh, informed. And very often people think of them as being very insensitive or they, they simply don't pay much attention to what's going on on the balance sheet of their bank. Um, as a result, relying on bank depositors seems to be a difficult task for them to achieve. Uh, what do you have in mind? Is it a regular depositor or wholesale? Uh, wholesale. It's not, wholesale about, yeah, it's not about in the, in a household like you and me. So like you and me, so we have the insurance and uh, probably right. we don't care about that. We have a government insurance. We sure, are thinking sure. about the wholesale, <laughs> yeah, the, the bigger uh, yeah. firms. Yes. Even Sure. Uh, then the follow-up point is, even for wholesale banking, uh, presumably those people are facing the extremely, what they call information insensitive uh, security, right? As a result, their incentive to care about risk is probably the lowest among all the stakeholders. Um, so here's a, uh, I understand the, the, the economic mechanism, but here's a, a quick comment. I don't know whether it makes sense eventually, why don't you guys look at the shareholders of the banks? Then maybe throw in the manager's agency problem. So the shareholders, presumably they are much more informationally sensitive. Uh -huh. I, I would okay. assume all the mechanisms you guys care about here will work through that channel as well. And okay. then the shareholders, maybe through the, the, some agency problems, they may actually make your mechanism much more powerful instead of relying on the uh, depositors. Even for wholesale banking, if, if I'm um, have a re, 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 um, uh, negotiate the short-term deposit with you, presumably I only care about the, those extreme events uh, that will damage the, the, uh, your balance sheet. Otherwise, I probably don't care as much. As a result, this channel of information transmission is much less uh, efficient, but maybe you, you only care about the systemic risk. Maybe that's also fine. Okay. But I thought maybe through the equity holders, I, I channel, see, yeah. you might be able to actually do more. But yeah, uh, th th thank you. Yes, yeah, so I, I think both both comments are great. And the, the first one, so uh, let's look at the, the second one first. To you, uh, I think you probably your suggestion or thinking about the equity holders. Uh, might work as well. I think that's a great idea, probably kind of intuitively, as long as uh, you have some reactions changing the funding cost. Our kind of main mechanism, if they changing the funding cost, the result will go through. So no matter it's coming from depositors or coming from equity holders, exactly. I think that's a great idea. The, the first one, uh, yeah, that our, our thought is initially it's like this, okay? Because Canada is talking about what's kind of the hidden risk, and uh, so we don't we don't know about the banking system. I think we think about what's the kind of first order feature of banking. So we think the first order feature of a banking system is a maturity mismatch. It's kind of the the borrowers had a long term, the deposit had short term. So that's why we think about this. Uh, this mm -hmm. might be kind of the first order important relevant thing. But you would point to another issue about empirical relevance. In reality, maybe those depositors not a sensitive uh, uh, that, uh, that much. Uh, I, I'm, so for that one, I'm not quite sure because it's kind of an empirical question. Um, mm. Yeah, we need to look at the empirical thing, but from uh, my understanding, if uh, kind of maturity mismatch is a, a key feature, then those uh, big institution, the, the depositors like a pension fund, they deposit money to uh, a bank. They should also care about the, the risk of my, my deposit. And so intuitively they should also react. So, so that, that's kind of um, my, but in, also in the literature, people also think like a rule over risk. They also think about depositors that will change their re reaction. But that, again, that's kind of model, right? Only theoretical models, how models um, assume. In, in reality, whether they are very sensitive, uh, I think I need to look into the empirical literature to find out, to find out so uh, how sensitive they are exactly. But a great, both, both comments are great. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe I can say yeah, that yeah, I, I, do, I do think there is empirical evidence that depositors are uh, attentive 
but but certainly we should uh, highlight that. Yeah. And, and I think that the key difference between depositors and equity holders is that depositors can take their money out at any time, whereas equity holders are basically locked in. Yeah. In that case, maybe what matters more is not the, the small differences in quality of a project, rather it's a major event that actually may shook the whole, shake the whole uh, balance sheet of the bank. So the type of the information uh, you guys care about is not a day-to-day -day small fluctuations, perhaps. Is that fair? Right. Because I'm a depositor, I don't care too much about how well you are doing. I only care about the, whether you mess up the whole thing. That's how yeah. Right. Yeah. No. That that's uh, that's fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. But, but also, I think your 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 contractor, the equity holders and the depositor, they work in the same similar mechanism. Maybe indeed, as long as they change the funding cost, so the mechanism should go through. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, uh, it seems like the rollover is not playing an explicit role in in in, in the story you told here. Rather, mm. it's um. No, it's not. Yeah, not exactly. Yeah, okay. not exactly. It's mainly about the when each bank bid for the borrower yeah, for the yeah. project, they think about the micro. What, what will be my funding cost? Yeah, or what yeah. Will be, exactly. So whether they will over bid aggressively or not. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You have a question. I thought. Uh, yes. So, uh, quite related to Hong Jun's question. So, first is on the theory side. Uh, if your timing, say, uh, let the depositors deposit money first, and then the banks make the investment decision. So in that case, even for non-household banking, uh, the depositor may play a less role in this game. So that is the uh, first question. The second one is that this open banking, uh, so sometimes the data sharing is between the traditional banking and the fintech companies. So for these fintech companies, um, it sounds like, how should I think about the depositors for these fintech companies? Yeah. So that's data sharing is not between banks, but between bank and the new uh, tech companies, basically. Uh, the, the first one, yeah, let's think about the first one. First one about the timing. Uh, so yeah. here, I think the deposit implicitly they deposit money at the very beginning. And then later on, when the banks Got the project, uh, the 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 project is the long term, supposedly the ten years or, two, or five years. But deposited the short term, like three months um, or, or one month, and the deposited had a chance to renegotiate. The way it matures, the uh, the maturity already expires and renegotiate. So that will, uh, so that, that will change the funding cost. Uh, so that so that I, I'm not sure whether that exactly addresses your concern or, or clarify the the, the, the point. Okay, so you allow them to renegotiate. The yeah, yeah, kind of. That's the uh, that's the implicit assumption. The maturity mismatch, basically. So the liquidity depositor they have a short term. The project has a long term. So the long term is locked. The return is so the but the short term funding cost is changing over time. Uh, so that, that that's that's the, the the first one. The second comment, if we, we think about the fintech firms, so, so those fintech firms, you think they only lend money to whether they can have that funding cost. I think like Ali here, they also have a, a, a bank, right? Ali here at the, what's the name called? Uh, I, I have that bank oh, account. My bank. Yeah. My bank. Uh, yeah, my bank, oh, my, bank. Yeah. My, my, my bank. Yeah, my bank, my bank. Yeah, they also have depositors. Uh, they also, I think FinTech firms, they also have their own depositors for some FinTech firms. Well, yeah, definitely not all FinTech firms. Uh, if I think, Probably a more complete picture, we should think about the two models, uh, another uh, variation. So uh, one bank has a traditional bank has its own depositor. The other FinTech firm does not have um, kind of depositor. Then uh, the funding cost will not be a concern for the FinTech competitor, for the challenger. Uh, will be more concern for the, for the, the relationship with the traditional bank. Uh, so that will be asymmetric. But our model, so far, we focus on asymmetric uh, banks. Yeah, that, 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 yeah, that's a good comment. Okay, uh, thank, thank you for the great comments. And uh, now uh, uh, let me preview the result. Uh, so the, the, the result, uh, we, we consider basically we consider a current banking uh, system. So in which the, uh, the home banks 
have uh, 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 the data, the entire data, and it processes the, the data and the information, and in, and uh, compare with open banking uh, system. Open banking, the, the both banks have information. And we, we, we found that in the current banking, this uh, the result is very kind of very similar to what uh, uh, kind of government had in mind. So we can show that if the, the home bank had the information only, it will become the informational monopolist. And this, they will charge all the rent from the borrowers. The borrowers basically has, has a, only the reservation value. All the rent will go to the, the bank. So this result, although intuitive, is non-trivial. Uh, because without the depositors' indulgence reaction, uh, they, this is not true. Uh, Robert Marcus had a paper in IFS. Uh, he and his he, quarter show that actually, even if you have a, a, a kind of an informed relationship with bank, as long as you also have another uninformed challenger, so the informed existing bank cannot become a monopolist, cannot get all the rent. So the, we, can, we can show it, 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 this, this bank becomes a monopoly rent because of the indulgence reaction of, uh, uh, of uh, depositors. So this is result uh, theoretically not trivial, but ex post kind of very intuitive, uh, very kind of also very consistent with the reality. So that's what uh, concerns the gov uh, Canada government. And think about all the five big banks that like a monopolist, uh, they kind of the borrowers uh, 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 ripped off. Uh, that's kind of the, the concern. But when we have open banking, we, we, we found that, that we, we can show that a unique in, uh, symmetric equilibrium and there are also a um, continuum of asymmetric equilibrium. Um, but uh, in terms of welfare, overall welfare, the result is identical across the different equilibria. But let's focus on the symmetric equilibrium. We find that uh, the result is also different from the existing literature. So they, the, the, in, the, in the symmetric equilibrium, the banks will, will not bid if they see a better signal. But even if they see a good signal, they may not bid. They bid with some probability. But this will com completely change the kind of the, uh, the, the rent distribution. Because if you think about it, in the current bank, they are like a monopolist. They will get all the rent. But in the open banking, those firms can choose not to bid even with the positive probability. They are playing mixed strategy, meaning that their rent is the reservation value. It more likely they change from a monopoly to a somehow very competitive bank. So their rent will reduce dramatically. So uh, that's uh, uh, kind of the, uh, the result of a very kind of striking. So they will, uh, their rent will just become the reservation value because even if they see a good signal, they will play mixed strategy. The mixed strategy by definition, meaning that the, their uh, equilibrium rent is equal to the reservation value. And in terms of overall welfare, so in the parameter range we focus on so far, we try to illustrate the idea most uh, transparently, we only focus on the, the, some parameter range. We found that so in terms of the two, the funding uh, efficiency and the screening efficiency, so they depend on to compare open banking versus the current banking. Uh, so whether so funding efficiency or screening efficiency is good or bad, it depends on the NPV of the product. If the product has a high NPV, high return, the funding efficiency will be good under open banking, but the screening efficiency will be bad under open banking. For low product, it's the opposite. Uh, so the screening efficiency will be good on, for open banking, is bad for uh, current banking. But overall, it turns out always the better thing dominates. The economic efficiency always become lower under uh, open banking. So in, in the parameter range we focus on. And uh, borrowers welfare will increase. Um, this is also consistent with the uh, the Canada government's uh, uh, argument. So, so the, if you look at this two two bullet points, this is kind of very very concrete to uh, the, the case of discussion in Canada. So the, in Canada, the, the government thinks, okay, now uh, the the banks are like a monopolist. They are like a vampire. They get all the rent, and we give the the, uh, the, the 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 data ownership to consumer. The consumer will increase their welfare, but we are concerned what will happen to the real the, the, the entire economy. So basically here we explained why that's happening in Canada now. So you, ha you have that vampire. And indeed, if you give data to consumers, they will become better off. But the most concern the Canada government is this, is, is about the overall, is about the, this funding efficiency, the screening efficiency, this interaction. If we show that this is the, what's happening. And what's driving this is the indulgence reaction of the depositor. The indulgence reaction of the depositor will amplify the vendor's curse problem 
that will reduce competition effectively and lower the overall welfare. So that, that's kind of the overall message. And uh, so how our model can concretely match to uh, the, the discussion in, in Canada. But it's also general, not only for Canada, it's also general for the US, for, for Australia, and also for China, because all the open banking kind of very, very similar in different areas. So that, that, that's kind of overall result. Uh, so now I, I try to talk about the literature. The literature, the paper is related to um, many, many papers. Uh, now I only focus on these three papers because they're very, very closely related. Let's, uh, the first one, uh, that a recent open banking paper by, by Zhi Guojing and, and Ji Dong, they have a, uh, they, they, I think uh, they focus on different perspectives. The Zhi Guojing and Ji Dong's paper mainly focus on the data control part. So they, uh, and they focus on the data sharing part. So the data control part, they find a very, very surprising, also a striking result. They find that open banking can reduce the overall welfare for everyone. Uh, so, so there the data control part works, it, uh, they allow those borrowers, they know their type and they can, they can choose whether they will share their data with other banks. So they know their type, the type, the, the kind of that signaling problem. If you sign up, there's the unraveling effect. If you sign up, you, 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 you will be a good consumer because in a model, it's kind of asymmetric. The FinTech firms will have more competition power. Their signal will be more precise. As a result, when you sign up, the competition actually become weaker because the FinTech will become more powerful. So those sign up people will become worse off. The, 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 the people who sign out did not sign up. Those people, they, they kind of suffer an inference problem like unraveling. So they, if they don't sign up, then people know this is a bad guy. So that guy, those guys, the welfare will also reduce. So that's kind of the main result of the paper. Uh, this is a very nice result showing that in for some parameter range, the borrower's welfare will be reduced. So that, that's kind of over trend that our kind of the, the, the initial intuitive argument, like Canada's case, they think that our borrower welfare will increase. Actually, in some cases, the borrower welfare will also decrease. And so our paper will take a bit abstract away from that part. So in our paper, we assume, okay, but we, uh, we assume data differs from the information. You think about uh, if you, you have a lot of transaction data, like uh, Ali here, if you have a lot of consumer data, uh, you have a kind of past consumption data, even if give you the data, you don't know how to use the data, right? The data is so complex. So only those banks, they have the algorithm. They know how to extract the information from the data. If we th basically, we think about the information, is a function of data uh, and the algorithm. So the algorithm uh, uh, kind of developed by, by banks. The data, although the data owned by consumers who is not useful, only combined with the algorithm, you can extract the information. You, you particularly like the consumption data. It's very, very complex. So as a result, so the, the consumers, they are uninformed in our model. They have no signaling problem. They, they always want to shop already. They always want to find different banks using their algorithm to generate different signals. And so they get more information and then they can get more, more, more risk, the shopping rate, the shopper rate. So that, in that way, we sort of get a way of the uh, data control issue uh, internally. So we think that the internal consistency in our model, that they always want to, although they have the data control, in equilibrium, by default, they always want to share data with other institutions because the data is not useful for them. So we are not arguing this is always true. We are, we are not arguing that this uh, consumer, they don't know their type is always. We just want to see that in some cases it's relevant and they also want to make the result very clean. We, we, we focus on different things like Jing, Zhi Guo and Ji Dong's paper focus on data control. We focus on totally different things, you know, data sharing. So that, that's kind of how you think about these two papers, the very, very complementary. And as a result, the, 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 the overall result is kind of different. That in their result, they emphasize borrower welfare will decrease. So here, borrower welfare can increase, but they focus on total welfare. Total welfare can decrease. It's more like the, the concern by uh, Canada government. So th this is the one paper, the very recent paper, very nice paper. So another um, uh, related, related literature is the banking competition literature. I just want to talk about the two papers here because they, they correspond nicely to the uh, current banking system and the open banking system. So th this one, the paper by Marcus and, uh, and, uh, and his co-author in 2003, the RFS paper. So this is more like the current banking system. So in this model, that one informed relationship bank, that also an uninformed bank who is a challenger. So, and so this is more like a current banking system. So, 
But the, uh, this one, the econometric paper, there are two banks, it's more like an open banking system. These two banks have the same, uh, have the, have, have, uh, both of them, this is symmetric, both of them have information, information conditionally independent. So this, if you think about from here to here, 2003 to 1990, it's more like a switch from current banking to open banking. So th this is like this, but both papers don't think about the endurance reaction of the depositors. As a result, if you switch from current banking to open banking, the welfare will already increase in this model. So this, this is what's happening in the model. If you, if you, if you allow another firm, if you switch from out current banking to open banking, you allow another firm to have information, you directly introduce a uh, kind of a competition because the other firm also had information. And if the information is identical, common signal, then this is the pure competition. So from IO intuition, competition will increase welfare. That's very intuitive. But if the information is heterogeneous, then the firms will also concern about the venous curse. But in this, in this paper, the, the venous curse is not strong enough to overturn the competition effect. And if you introduce the endurance reaction of, uh, of uh, depositors, the venous curse will be amplified. So the negative effect will be so strong such that the open banking system can, under this open banking system, the welfare can be reduced. So that, that's kind of how you think about the, the, the relation between our paper and the open banking literature. So I, I'm not sure whether people have a question. Let's see. So th this is about the overall idea uh, and also how we contributed to the literature. So overall, we, uh, I think the, we, we study kind of the interaction between borrowers banks and the depositor, we think that the, the endorsed response of depositors and the, the resulting funding cost will be the main contribution to the mechanism and that will overturn all the results in the literature. We also think it's kind of um, realistic. So th this is the, the main result. Now I'm going to move, move on to the kind of boring part, the, the, the model part. So th this will be, uh, the, the model setup. So we have three dates, uh, data zero, data one, and data two. So at a data zero, there's a borrower, the borrower we call it a Jack, try to borrow $1. And this borrower had a product. The product will produce a return uh, R, which is a positive number or nothing uh, with the probability of theta. So the theta is a random variable. So this theta can be high or low. So kind of we make it extreme. If it's a low, so you can see if theta is low, is zero, this, this product will always fail and it produce nothing. If it's high, it will, if theta is high is equal to one, so this product will always succeed. It will produce, always produce R. And this jack also has a limited liability and a prior uh, for high or low is one half. It's very symmetric. Uh, but this is not a, important. You can assume any number like a Q or some number, it's the equivalent to changing the value of R. So this is, identical. So we just want to make it uh, simple. So that, that, that's the product part. So there are two banks, very symmetric. It's, it's unlike um, uh, what Ian had in mind. It's like a, a traditional bank, a fintech. So we are not uh, considering that yet. There are two banks, very, very symmetric. Bank one is uh, uh, the borrower's home bank. The home bank had the data, now also own the data, can produce um, a conditional signal. So given the data, and the signal I be high or low, kind of with the property pi, the pi is larger than one half, the prior is one half. So if it's larger than one half, this signal is informative. So bank two is a challenging bank, the alternative bank. So without any data, the bank two cannot produce information. It's uninformed. So the banks are risk neutral. They also have a limited liability. That's why this uh, depository care about that. Uh, so the, 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 that also for the, for the bank, it also uh, alternative uh, uh, opportunity of investment. Uh, so the, as, a support, as opposed to lend the money to Jack, the bank can deposit $1 to another product, which is risk-free, produce a return RA. This A mean the alternative. But this is the constant. We, we, we assume this RA and, uh, and, uh, and R and apply exalted parameters. So we assume this parameter range. And then now we are still working on the other uh, areas. So intuitively, R is smaller than 2RA, 
It's like the NPV is uh, X ante is negative for two bank because the bank, the cost is uh, RA. You, you can invest in RA. The, the prior, the one half, uh, so this uh, the, like the one half of the investment for uh, two bank is smaller than RA. So this kind of NPV is negative. And uh, we also assume this R is larger than RA over pi, meaning pi multiplied by R is greater than RA. So meaning if you see one signal, which is good, so this will turn the NPV to positive. So you can kind of, this, uh, this is the parameter range we focus on, that will make the result the most, most striking and the most transparent. Um, but we think it's also kind of intuitive, right? It's kind of the, I mean, the NPV is negative, probably you need the bank to do something. But, but we, we are working on other uh, parameter ranges. So this is the depositor. So each bank finance uh, $1 from a competitive depositor and they promise to pay a return R. This, this little R is the indulgence. So that's, a, in, that's the uh, renegotiation part. That R will be indulgence determined, I mean, so later on, that's indulgence. And the, the bank investment will be disclosed to everyone. The, the losing bank is quote is not disclosed. So uh, we are still working on this one. I we think this result, is, this assumption is not very crucial. Um, but now we focus simplicity, we assume this. And for the dep depositor, depositor also has a reservation value. It's a risk-free rate RA. This is exogenous. So this, uh, so the RA is um, uh, smaller than, than capital RA, but larger than Y. So this is kind of the, uh, the, 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 the assumption that the banks have advantage in making investment. So that their investment in capital RA, uh, if you invest in a risk-free project, uh, but for depositors, they have a cost or uh, kind of requirement of a little RA. So this little RA is exogenous. And when you think about renegotiation, it's very, very simple. So the renegotiation will determine this um, uh, R. This R basically is this little R, this R multiplied by the posterior equal to this uh, re required value RA. So this, um, this one is the endurance posterior. So the, the vending bank's depositor will try to infer about the quality of the borrower. So that, that's endurance. So this one is the endurance, this one is the endurance, this RA is exogenous. So this is a very, very simple. So what, what important here is how the depositor will make inference about my bank's uh, project. So if my bank is product is good, I will require low rate. If the, the product is, 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 high, is bad, I'm going to require the high cost. So this is kind of the funding cost. So this is the key mechanism. We try to make this part endogenous, which is generated from the, the, the maturity mismatch feature of banking that will drive all the results. So we, we have a benchmark, we, we, we make this uh, little R fix. You, can, you, will see the result, you will see the result totally opposite. Okay, and I, I highlighted so in our model, we try to different our model from Jim's paper. We assume here the information is not equal to data. So here the information is coming from data and algorithm. So the banks will have algorithm. The consumers, all the current bank have data. The consumers even see the data cannot generate uh, kind of information. As a result, in our model, those, those consumers uh, always, those, those borrowers always to shop rate. And they always go to, uh, they, if they have the data, they always go to another bank and say, oh, this is my data, generate the signal, just give, give me a quote. If your quote is the lower, I'm going to use your quote. This is kind of the idea. Uh, so different from Zhigo and Jing's paper, in Zhigo and Jing and Jidong's paper, they assume those borrowers know the information. So they, they know the type, they know the type so they can have an unraveling result. So that, that's what makes our result, the paper different from their uh, paper. So here, if you are in open banking, the bank two will use the data uh, carried by the, the borrower and generate a different signal. The signal is conditionally independent from bank one's signal. So they are conditionally di different. We want to capture, they have a different algorithm. So at least algorithm is different from a Gongshan Yinhang's algorithm. So this different algorithm will generate a different signal. Even if you have the same, info, same data, the information will be different. Okay, uh, so, be, be, before I move on, so I, I see a question in the chatting room asked by Kabin. Kabin, do you want to ask directly by yourself? Yeah, Kabin asked in the model, do bank consumers commit to using the same bank for depositing and borrowing services, uh, the uh, customers? 
the borrowers know the borrowers they have the data they can carry the, that's the idea of open banking so the once you give the data to borrowers the borrowers can use the data to allow any other third party to use so they don't uh, have a commit right that's that what the earlier question uh, when you were talking okay. about the introduction not not yet the model okay so yeah okay, right, sorry, but, no problem great. okay great so do you have an additional question no uh, not at the moment okay uh, so now um i see i see i, see, I think um i see a scratch here it's not me yeah i don't know who did that it's um, magical so now let's, let's now look at the current banking system so what's happening this is not very intuitive although very intuitive is not a trivial it's very very intuitive so, but theoretically not a trivial so on the current banking system suppose the bank one is a relationship bank had all the data had the information the challenging bank bank two had no information so we can show that the bank one so for, for example like like in my case so i'm the customer so my bank is cibc so cibc will charge all the rent from me so this is it's a, that, that's what the concern the canada government so this kind of government thinks okay the, the currently all the five bigger banks they are monopolies so they charge everything they get everything so we can show this is indeed the case. So what, what, what this is what's happening in the model. So the bank, so for, for, the, for the second bank, the, the bid, the interest is infinity. So this kind of, if you, you charge the infinity rate, it's a, meaning it's, a, it's not a participating. It's a, uh, that, that's kind of the mathematical way to uh, interpret the non-participating. So for bank, bank one, if bank one see the bad, bad signal, bank one will, will not participate. But if bank one see a good signal, bank one will charge rate R. The R is the, all the all the basically return. You, you remember that the, uh, that the borrower is uh, going to if if it's a good signal H, the borrower will generate zero with the probability of one minus pi, or generate R with the probability probability pi. So if the borrower generate pi or R with the probability pi, it will give all the money to uh, to the bank. If generate zero, nothing will go to, to, to give the bank because it's a limited liability. So basically, the borrower will give everything to the bank. The bank had a, had a, had, a, had all the rent. So the, we show this is a unique equilibrium and the unique equilibrium satisfying intuitive criteria. The, 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 this this is not very very intuitive. It's a sound kind of because the bank had the information uh, and can charge the information rent. This also the, the the argument put forward in the informal discussion here. Uh, but that result is not very trivial. So to to illustrate this, uh, so let me show this using the. Uh, the following argument. So I try to, uh, to to show that this this result is is driven by the depositors' uh, uh, endurance response that will amplify the vendor's curse. Now you suppose you, you think about giving bank of one's trading strategy, uh, bidding strategy. You think, you think about what the bank two will react. Uh, so because in in Mark's paper he showed that in in his model in his model in RFS paper two thousand three there are two banks informed and uninformed. He showed that. In this case, both firms will play mixed strategy. So they, even if informed bank has no information, the informed bank will, will participate with some random, uh, will, 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 with some ran, randomization. And the uninformed bank has a rent zero, the informed bank has a positive rent, but the uninformed bank will participate. That's, the, that, that's what he found. That the participation threat from the uninformed bank will reduce the rent of informed. And that will leave some rent to the borrower. So, the, but in our model, the borrower had nothing. The borrower had zero. And now let's see so why that's the case. What's happening here exactly? You suppose bank two try to participate, and also we think about the the the, the, the best case if bank two participate and offer a bid R two. The R two cannot be larger than R. It must be smaller than R because R is the maximum that the borrower can offer. Suppose bank bank two wins. If bank two wins, it must be the case that the other bank, bank one, see a better signal, right? Because if you see a good signal, both of them compete, it cannot, it can, kind of, they, they have the uh, kind of some, some probability win. But now if it wins for sure, the other bank must see a better signal. So the posterior, as a result, is smaller than one half because prior to one half, if you see a better, better signal, you do the inference is smaller than one half. Now rem remember the indulgence reaction of falling cost is given by RA divided by this uh, posterior, so it must be larger than two RA. Now you think about the bank two's payoff in our model. 
bank to the payoff is the bidding minus the funding cost. And at the most, the, prob the, the winning probability is one half because it's, it's uh, uh, the prior is, is one half. Now I know the prior is the posterior is less than one half. And this is at most this amount. And this is because B2 also smaller than capital R, it will be smaller than this one. And by our, our, uh, uh, this, this will, by our, our assumption is because it two, uh, uh, one over two R smaller than RA, this negative NPV. So this, you can show this is smaller than the reservation value. If a bank two does not lend to Jack, invest money in a risk-free project, it will get a capital RA and give funding costs later RA to its depositor. So that will be the, the reservation value. So this, is, this is shows that this cannot be the case, right? Those bank two will not participate in our model. But now you see that the key is this is two RA here. This is the red part. Because on, if you don't have this red part, if this um, uh, become um, kind of a fixed uh, uh, RA is the funding cost, so we can show this can be supported as a mixed strategy. So basically, if you get rid of this deposit in dollars response, the informational monopoly is not an equilibrium, although intuitive, although it's describing reality, or it's happening here, it's, it's not an equilibrium without the endorsed response of the depositors. So we basically, we found that this endogenous depositors response will rationalize and explain what's happening here in, uh, in Canada. Okay, uh, that's kind of the uh, current banking system. Now let's move on to the open banking system. Suppose you have two banks and Professor now- Young? Uh, yes, Yingju. Uh, uh, okay, before you move on, um, I'd like to ask a question about the assumption of the risk neutral of both banks and also deposit. For deposit, I was wondering how robust this pure strategy is because if it becomes risk averse, then there are things like a uh, bank run. Of course, Professor Goldstein is an expert here. So that concern may break the simple reaction rule. Uh, yeah. And also for banks, if I think uh, if, if those banks are risk, uh, have different level of risk aversion, for example, in China, we observed very, uh, those small banks are willing to take very high risk and uh, therefore they can beat higher deposit rate. That's, that's how the central government decided to, to regulate this uh, online deposit more strictly. So I was wondering how, how important these two assumptions is for the current result because the result is really clean and nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Itai, as the expert, do you want to take this question? I, I, I want to take a rest, drink some water. <laughs> um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I uh, followed the, the logic because I, I don't think that the risk neutral assumption is related to uh, bank run uh, behavior. I mean, you, you, would, you would get the, the bank run. Uh, with risk neutral or without risk neutral, so so I'm not I'm not sure I followed. I mean I I understand uh, the importance of looking into uh, risk aversion uh, and and sort of seeing the overall robustness, but but I'm not sure the, the connection to to bank on. Maybe I missed that. Yes, I I think risk neutrality is here is mainly for tradability, but I buy your uh, your argument that the different banks have a different risk aversion because they have different supports, right? Like a different system. Uh, yeah, we, for, for, for kind of transparency, we didn't consider that yet. Thank you, Yingju. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now it's about the, the, the open banking part. The open, open banking is the more uh, kind of complicated the result. So, but we, show, no, we focus on the symmetric equilibrium and at the very end, I just briefly talk about the asymmetric equilibrium. Mm, I think I have a, a half a number and uh, uh, so the symmetric equilibrium, the result also very kind of intuitive. I first described the, intu the, 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 the what's happening in equilibrium. And then I try to sketch the proof very, very quickly uh, uh, and, and then move on to talk about the efficiency. The symmetric equilibrium also very, uh, in, in result very intuitive, um, but very, very, very different from the existing literature. So this is what's happening. So each bank now is symmetric. So if the bank see the bad signal, the bank will not bid. Basically, it's a infinity means that it's a charge interest of infinity, that's, a, that's not a bidding. And if the bank see the high signal, 
the bank is playing a mixed strategy. And with some probability gamma, the bank will not bid with this point of mass, some probability gamma, which is endogenous. With some probability, with some probability the bank will randomize between the lower um, range and the letter R, uh, randomized with some um, endogenous probability uh, distribution F B. So that, that's the what's happening so in the model. If the bank see the better signal, the bank will quit, will not bid. But if the bank see the good signal, the bank will not bid with some probability, but will bid with some probability uh, uh, random and mixed strategy. But this randomization, this part, will imply the bank's payoff is given by the alternative reservation value, right? Because the, the randomization not bidding will generate the payoff of the, of the reservation value. And since you randomize between bidding and not bidding, the payoff of your not bidding is equal to the payoff of bidding, which means that the payoff is this uh, reservation value. So th this means that the payoff of the bank will drop dramatically. Right? Initially, the bank is a monopoly guy. If you got get all the rent, now the bank only get a reservation value. So that will make the bank's pro overall profit will drop, drop uh, dramatically. So that, that's um, uh, what's happening. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the behavior and in terms of the welfare consequences for the bank. And now let, let me briefly kind of sketch it. So how we prove that is the intuitively. Uh, so we have three steps. The first step, so we first show kind of that a new point of mass above this um, uh, R, which is the, the, the highest return and also below the lower bound we assume. And this is just a, argued by some bank uh, competition. And then we show this uh, uh, for the randomization, this R is the highest value. This is justified by some of equilibrium argument, the intuitive criteria. So what really matters is this step. So we want to show, so why if bank, each bank see the good signal, the bank is still randomized. Because this is very different from the, that econometric 1990, that econometric paper. Because in that econometric paper, they show that uh, they only play pure strategy. If they see good signal, they will bid. Better signal, they will not bid. So they do not randomize in this uh, uh, in, in this good signal situation. And, and uh, th th that's kind of very different. We also show that this again is driven by the endogenous reaction of depositors. So the behavior is, is driven by our new feature. So now you suppose or not? Suppose the uh, the, the bank does uh, not randomize. And now you think about what will happen. If you, uh, you, you bid R, uh, then that means you imply the other bank observe a better signal because, because the other bank also kind of also bid with some probability if you see a good signal. So if you, you, can, you can win with this very high value, that means the other bank must see a better signal. And now the funding cost will, will change to this one. And then, so, the, the, and then so you can see the expected payoff. You can, we can, we can show it will be lower than the reservation value. And so this kind of, kind of uh, contradiction argument will show that these banks will uh, randomize. Uh, so this is basically we have three steps and they show uh, how we construct the equilibrium. How to, this, this symmetric equilibrium is unique. And we also can, uh, can show that this result is driven by deposit response, because if you don't have a deposit response, that will be similar to that econometric paper. So this bank, these banks will uh, kind of uh, play um, this strategy. They will bid if and only if they see a good signal. If they see a better signal, they will not bid. If they see a good signal, they will bid for sure. So, that, so this kind of behavior-wise, we show the result totally different from the traditional literature and what's driving this is the internal reaction of depositors. So this is what's happening in equilibrium. Now let, let me move on to uh, efficiency. So I'm going to talk about the, the two uh, types of efficiency, the funding efficiency and screening efficiency, and then you, we try to aggregate them. So funding efficiency is more like, a, I think it's a, uh, it's a type of one or type, it's a type of one error, right? So some, so basically one is the type one, the other one is the type two ever. Basically conditional, this is the good firm. You should find that. So what's the probability? So that's what we try to say. And the funding probability under the current banking system is pi, because remember in the current banking system, it's a monopoly. If the bank 
relationship will back see the better signal will not be. If the relationship see the good signal always the bit, be the with R, and then that, that's the kind of the, the, the relationship will see a good signal, relationship back will see a good signal with the probability pi. So the founding probability is uh, given by kind of given by this pi, basically. Given, given is a good product. Um, and you but on the open banking, on the open banking, both the firms uh, will uh, not a bit seeing bad signal, seeing good signals will not a bit with probability gamma. So that, that, that's what's driving it here. So suppose both firms giving this good, uh, good type, see good signals, so that's how pi squared, because each firm see good signal in the pi, conditional independent, another firm is also pi. So pi squared, meaning both firms seeing good signals. Only if both of them not bidding, so which is the gamma squared, so the product will not be founded. So the complementary probability of one minus gamma squared is the probability being founded. So this is pi squared multiplied by one minus gamma squared is the case in which both firms seeing good signal and the, the, the product is founded. So th this one is one firm see good signal, the other firm see better signal, when the firm see better signal, the firm that the better signal firm will not buy, will not bid. But the firm seeing good signal also with the probability gamma not bidding. So one minus gamma is the probability of bidding. And because you have a two probability, right? You have one from one see good signal, from two see good signal, so you have a two probability and them up. So that, that's kind of the probability of getting funded giving the type is good. And we can we can show this uh, this probability finding a probability is increasing in pi, uh, in, in, sorry, in, increasing in gamma, uh, in R, and the increasing in R, and uh, this QH is pi. So we compare them, and if this blue curve is above the red line, finding efficiency is higher under open banking. So. So what, what's the intuition here? So why sometimes the funding efficiency is good, funding efficiency is bad? Because of the two competing forces. Intuitively, if you allow another firm having information, you have more competitions and you have more possibility. Intuitively, if other things are being equal, you have more possibility being funded because the other firm also inform, they also compete, offer you another one. Given the in the current system, the other firm not all always not a, not a bidding. You only have one firm bidding, right? So this kind of you have one firm bidding switch to two firm bidding. You have a higher probability of getting funded. Other things being equal, but because of the endurance re reaction of depositors, each bank will bid less aggressively. So they are concerned about the vendors' curves being amplified by the funding cost. So those firms will bid less aggressively. So as a result, the probability of getting funded also become lower. So this kind of each bank bidding less aggressively, now you have two banks. So which effect will dominate is kind of product of these two things, the, the interaction. So we, we, can, we can show that when, when this R is sufficiently high, so when the NPV is sufficiently high, then the, uh, the, the, uh, the positive effect will dominate. So otherwise, the negative effect will dominate. So that, that's the, uh, the, the result about the funding efficiency. And it, uh, we can also think about the screening efficiency. Screening efficiency is very, very similar. So screening efficiency said, suppose this product is bad, is it, low quality. Now, you don't want this product being funded. Now let's just compute the product of uh, being, uh, uh, being funded under the current system, again, the monopoly bank will bid only if it sees a good signal. So remember the, the signal, it looks like this, S1 equal to H given theta equal to L is one minus pi. Probability S1 equal to L given theta L equal to pi. So the bank will bid only if the bank sees a good signal given this product is bad, the, the probability is one minus pi. So the, Funding probability under the current banking system is one minus pi. So what's the probability funding probability under open banking? The competition is very, very similar to the previous one of funding uh, uh, probability under uh, open banking for good quality. So this is kind of this one is suppose both of them see good signal. This one is one see good signal, one see better signal. So the kind of the, 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 
the, the summation is very, very similar to the previous one. Now, again, you compare this blue curve and with the red line. Uh, so now, because this is a better, better uh, product, so only the blue curve is smaller than the red line is good, right? So this is, this, in this case, the, uh, the open banking is good. So in this case, open banking is bad. The current banking is good. So this kind of, the, the overall result is if R is sufficiently high, so the funding efficiency, open banking will dominate. So when R is low, funding efficiency, uh, no, uh, screening efficiency, uh, 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 the, the, the open banking will dominate. So it's kind of, this is, that is, that's a tension, right? If you increase R, that will be good for, from funding efficiency perspective, but that will be better for kind of uh, screening efficiency perspective. If you lower R, it's kind of opposite. So that, that's all with the tension. Now, what's happening for the overall welfare? So we compute the overall welfare. So this overall welfare, so this, this can, you think about the, the open banking. So this one is given theta is equal to H. And with the probability pH, that will be funded. And this is the overall, that, that's, the, 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 uh, that's the, the revenue, which is R. This is the cost. Uh, so that this one is not funded. And if you're not funded, the firm will make the money to the investment, a risk-free investment, and minus the cost. And this case is uh, theta equal to L. If theta equal to L, if it's funded, that's bad because you generate a zero. And if it's not funded, you put the money to alternative that will generate RA. So that, that's the, the overall uh, kind of welfare for open banking. Similarly, you can compute the overall welfare for under banking and we can compare them. So the, the, the result is kind of very striking. So we found that, so open banking, in, at least in our parameter range, open banking always bad relative to uh, current system in terms of the overall welfare. It's always the negative. We plot the difference, basically meaning open banking welfare always smaller than current uh, banking uh, welfare for the current parameter range. So always smaller. So, so why is the case? So we, we think about intuition like this. Re recall that, so the open, open banking, so A for R is high. A for R is, a, A for R is a high, uh, funding efficiency is good for open banking. But A for R is a low, uh, screening efficiency is good for open banking. So, but it, when, when the MPV is always negative. So when MPV is not negative, but suppose R is, uh, is closer to, to RA, that MPV is closer to zero. So in this case, this MPV is closer to zero. So you need to be very, very careful to kind of to, uh, to, to screen this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this MPV, this product. But it's very, very close to zero. It can be either good or other bad. It's a very nice for edge case, right? Screening is very, very important. You need to identify which one is good, which one is bad. So, but, but screening efficiency, it's bad on this case for opening uh, banking, for open banking when R is very high. But because the NPV is close to zero, now you, you need, really need some expert to, to say, okay, the, whether it's good or bad, try to screen the good thing. So that's, but in this case, screening efficiency is bad for open banking. So when NPV is close to zero, screening efficiency matters more. I, I, I'm not sure whether I, 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 so this is kind of rough intuition for that. And the, but but the when, um, when, 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 when MPV becomes very, very negative, so in that case, so in that case, it's by the very likelihood, high likelihood, you will give up that MPV. But in this case, it's like the, you try to pick up the, 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 the gem from the, the stone. You, you get the, the, the good thing. And in that case, the funding efficiency becomes more kind of important, in the, relatively speaking. Um, but in that case, the funding efficiency is uh, worse on the open banking system. So that's kind of our rough intuition. So somehow to, so, so for, for, for wide range, uh, for high R range, open banking is good for, from perspective of funding efficiency, but at this time, screening matters more. For, for, for smaller R, uh, screening efficiency kind of uh, good for open banking, but at this time, funding efficiency matters more for the overall welfare. So it's like the open banking is always on the wrong side. 
so when you do something good, but it's always on the wrong, uh, on the wrong, wrong time, at the wrong time or on the wrong side, and the result of overall welfare becomes worse off. Um, so that, that's uh, the rough intuition. We are still uh, teasing out a better wording for that. And we also show that this result. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I may miss something. So when calculating the exanti efficiency, did you take the average of the funding efficiency and the screening efficiency? Uh, yes, the funding efficiency and screening efficiency is related to those probabilities, the pi, uh, pH and the PIL. But here, when we talk about the welfare, we compute the payoff. Yeah, we, we, it's, it's not a simple average. So this is, this, this, this is what the, we just compute the payoff of all, all players. Oh. Okay, yeah, now I'm just yeah, thinking like if your policy implication depends on your weights on the two types of errors. Uh, oh, yes, that, that's another, I think, yeah, that's another good observation. So he, yeah, it basically about the objective function, right? Objective function, yeah. you can think about because the type of one, type of two error. It's like econometric. Yeah, econometric, we talk about of, type of one, yes. Type yeah. of one, type of two error, and then we, uh, as a so econometrician, we care about sometimes more about the type of one error, more about the type mm -hmm. two error. Yeah, here is a, we take a, a more economic perspective. We compute the overall payoff, uh, average ex ante payoff of all players. We treat them equally and sum them up. Uh, for, for example, th th this is how we got. So this one half, meaning the product is, uh, is, uh, uh, is good. And then you think about how, what's the likelihood you will be funded in the pi edge. Uh, pH, and this is the revenue, this is the cost, and this is probably not funded. It is not funded that the money will go to alternative investment, which is the risk free minus the cost. So, this is the payoff for the uh, high product case. And this similarly, this is a product, uh, the payoff for the low product case, uh, low quality product case. And then we just compute the payoff, uh, every payoff. This is and, and how, how, okay, how is this related to the Two types of efficiency. Yeah, it's, it's related to the two type of order. because if you compare these two, right? The compare these two you, to do the minus, you see the pH is related to QH, PL is related to QL. It's not a, it's a complicated related, but it's not a very simple if you think about this welfare. So this is, I think what you suggest is you think of, we think about the pH minus the QH. This is the, the other one is the PL minus QL and the, with some of it by minus of it. Uh, of W, uh, so yeah. I, I, this is something what you have in mind. Yeah, maybe there's another objective function, uh, but what we do here is a different. We, this is like a, statistic, a statistical kind of probably so statistical objective. So this is the, more like a, the traditional economic perspective we consider. Yes, uh, this is related, but not a uh, uh, kind of in a trivial way, and we also consider. Uh, suppose we shut it down, so before we shut down the, the endurance response of the depositor and they consider what will happen in terms of behavior, what's happening, positive implication, what's happening about what each person will be, how each person will behave. Now we also consider the welfare. If you shut down the depositor's response, what will happen to the welfare? So we, we found that if you compare, now you compare it to welfare. So it's, it's not like uh, it's always open banking, always bad. So now open banking can be good for for, uh, for, for this parameter range, which is very large, open banking is better for this parameter range. So this, uh, if you shut down the funding cost channel, open banking can become better uh, for larger parameter, larger range of parameter values. So, that, so this also shows that the dominance, uh, uh, kind of the dominance of current banking over, uh, over um, open banking, the always dominance is driven by the endurance behavior of depositors. So because of the, the, the result are also very different. So, so basically we have a benchmark shutting down the uh, endurance behavior of the depositors. We, we see that the, I, both the positive implications and the normative, the welfare implications will be very different. So for, finally, I'm going to talk about the uh, borrower welfare and also the asymmetric equilibrium. And then the borrower, so the, this is kind of the distribution of welfare. Right, in the, in the current banking system, the borrower welfare will have zero profit they, because the, the current the relationship bank is a monopoly. That, that guy will get all the rent, so that get the maximum rent. And the bank two will get the uh, alternative rent, which is RA minus the little RA. 
but the bank of bank gets a lot of rent and the borrower gets a zero profit. Under open banking, we find the result is kind of totally changed, very, very striking. The, under open banking, the borrower had the data transferred to all banks, to both the banks, and now the competition becomes uh, kind of very, very strong and they will drive down the interest rate charge. And so they will make the borrower's ex ante payoff strictly positive. And each bank, their payoff will become the reservation value. Now, bank of two uh, payoff does not change. Bank of one payoff will decrease. Borrower's payoff will increase. Overall welfare will become lower. So that's what's happening about the distribution of welfare and the overall welfare. And finally, it's about asymmetric equilibrium. This one, and we spend a lot of time in deriving this equilibrium to show this is a unique equilibrium. And we discussed the, 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 the paper, the earlier version with, uh, with uh, Zhiguo and, and Jidong. And they mentioned to us kind of what, what we are having, whether you have asymmetric equilibrium. And we spend a lot of time to, to indeed we find it as a continuum of asymmetric equilibrium. So intuitively, it looks, it looks like this. Uh, originally, the symmetric equilibrium, each bank, if they see a good signal, they will, they will bid with the probability uh, Y minus gamma according to this distribution, and will not bid with the probability gamma. If you see better signal, we are not bid. But now you can still show one bank will still do the same. The other bank will shift part of the non-bidding probability from, from this infinity to this R. So they shift from part of it to here. So that, like you rho plus uh, kappa is equal to the original gamma. So that's the unique asymmetric equilibrium uh, that satisfies intuitive criterion. That's all the equilibrium. It's kind of very, very, very interesting, basically. But the welfare consequence is identical, overall welfare. Uh, distribution is different, but the overall welfare will be identical. Uh, so that, that's kind of the asymmetric equilibrium. It's kind of, it takes a lot of time to show that's the unique equilibrium because it's, uh, you have a lot of steps to show that no hole, all these kind of things. It's, uh, that, that's basically, the, the result for asymmetric equilibrium. Uh, so now let me summarize. I think I have a few minutes left for the question. So what, what do we do here? We, we propose a model to think about, to conceptualize the open banking. So we think open banking has two important features. One is the data control, the other one is data sharing. So this paper, we, we abstract from a data control by making a kind of internet consistent argument. And we consider only open uh, or the, the uh, data sharing feature of open banking. And, it, uh, and we, we found that, that what was kind of driving all the new results is the endogenous response of uh, depositors. That will capture the key feature of uh, maturity mismatch of banking system. And that endogenous response will increase the funding cost. As a result, they will amplify vendors' cost. And this channel, will change all the results. The, the kind of equilibrium very different from existing models. And also the welfare will be very, very different from the existing models. So the, the, the result I think um, uh, kind of related to the open banking literature because this is kind of very different from the, 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 the existing models also complementary to another open banking paper by, by Jing and, uh, and the Zhiguo and the Jidong. So they, they focus on kind of data control uh, and on reveling, we focus on uh, data sharing and uh, endorse the funding costs. So that result, uh, they focus on borrower welfare, they focus on overall welfare. So that, that's uh, the channel different, but the study very, very complex. Thank you. So I can, yes, I, question. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think the model is really uh, interesting. I probably got some on a rough understanding of what's going on there. Um, I think the essence here for, for the cost if you like to call it cost of open banking is the winner's curse that is amplified by depositors uh funding channel right monitoring yes yes yeah so it seems like your model had the following implication if you uh, allow a little bit of speculation uh so if you can somehow minimize this cost through winner's curse it will improve the welfare of the whole economy and yeah. it, it seems like they, in the model, the banks are moving simultaneously. Is that right? Yeah, the banks are moving simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. So, so they, the first, yes. Yeah, yeah. So that probably is the setup where the winner's curse uh, is very likely to happen. 
So if you uh, so just speculate, maybe slightly outside your model, if you allow the borrowers to shop around sequentially, sequentially. something mm -hmm. like sequentially, intuitively, I would have thought the winner's curse will be mitigated somewhat because if I go to bank, your bank, you give me an offer, maybe which is valid for uh, a week. In the meantime, I go to another bank, I get another, I also show your offer to another bank, basically forcing the banks to compete sequentially. And to, to some extent, they can rely on the signal from the other bank. And that minimizes to some extent the winner's curse because I can see partially see your signal, private signal. Um, maybe that will minimize the uh, winner's curse cost a little bit. So the, the funding cost, uh, so the funding, uh, the monitoring channel uh, you're analyzing will have a smaller effect. And obviously, uh, exactly, the banks will, will uh, respond by maybe being a little more strategic to, to, to cover their private signal. So uh, one, one way to speculate what we can learn from your model is perhaps this policy implication, which kind of is pushing the banks to compete more by allowing this, making the sequential uh, shopping more uh, easier for the borrowers. Yeah, so sequential shopping allow those banks partly uh, share information, right? Yeah, like, more like the forcing system. the banks to share their private yeah. signal to some extent, algorithm uh, induced the private signal to, to share that. That yes. may be uh, one way to push, uh, the lesson we are learning from your model. Yeah, that simultaneous move to sequential move. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about it. Uh, yeah, I, I can see the flavor. Yeah, mm. yeah obviously, sure exactly that. the banks will also <laughs> respond by covering up their information to some extent, but it seems yeah. like the direction is pushing them to compete more. After all, the goal of open banking is pushing banks to compete more than before. Yes, yeah. And yes. this is basically based on your insight because of winner's curse is the problem. And your model implies that any policy that minimize, reduces the impact from winner's curse will be helpful. One way is to allow sequential shopping. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm not sure whether Itai want to add something here. I can see the point. No, I, I think it's interesting. You yeah. should think about it. Uh, Lian? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I have to go. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Uh, so, i sorry that I came in late, later than you presented the uh, <laughs> full model. Uh, I see through the whole picture and uh, I like it. The, the biggest question to me is at this point, seems like the diversification of these loans going to be the I mean, in a way that I'm thinking about these open banking, the things that I'm re re reading are very, very small loans. So in what sense that the, this information structure in the broker paper are going to lead to some uh, like a run of banking deposit side? Yeah, that's a, I think that's related to Hong Jun's earlier question. about. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, Sorry. Hong Jun asked a question here uh, at a very early stage about yeah, I would like you to just comment on it because yeah. I, I think that's at least at this stage that's that's the real uh, yeah, so uh, things that you are muted. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, and I think yeah, Hong Jin mentioned as a related comment, basically Hong Jin commented about it. so how sensitive those depositors reaction to this kind of uh, kind of behaviors of the, the banks. Uh, so I. I, I, the, there we discussed the two things. First of all, Hong Jin also mentioned another channel about the, probably if we don't think about the depositor, might think about the equity holders because the main channel works through changing funding costs. So as long as you have some people reacting to this uh, uh, kind of lenders behavior, uh, they care about the, 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 pro the potential, the, uh, the, the quality of the potential uh, product. So they can change the funding cost. So, so that's kind of speculation, the one thing. Another one is more about the empirical thing that really to your, directly related to your question about the how depositors are sensitive to the this kind of information. And uh, 
So I, 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 I don't have a good answer to that because it's kind of more like an empirical question. We just initially, I discussed some theory papers that have similar assumptions because it's more like a liquidity, uh, the maturity mismatch. So those uh, the deposit, not as small investors, like a whole wholesale uh, pension fund, those kind of things. They also care about a lot. They, if they have a short term and those funding oh. uh, product have long term, and uh, I, so they should care about it's like the roll over things. And a time I, I, mentioned I would have no a, doubt that they care about the information. Yeah. What I meant is uh, the particular loan that, Open uh, banking. that they are making it, within the model, the particular loan they are making that uh, that could trigger the the fundamental it on, issue. Uh, it, also. Yeah, it depends on the size of the loan, right? Depend on, you, you said that it, so long it's small. Mm -hmm. if, if the loan itself is very small, that it probably it's not an entire concern, but like at least by the Canada government, that they care about the, 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 the kind of if I, I, all the banks move to the open banking system, I care about the financial stability. As long as they care about the financial stability, that imply that the loan side already reached a certain size, that they can shake the, the system. So if yeah, if it's kind of very small, a few banks, so who cares? We probably don't care about it. But only about the open banking reach a larger size, uh, they will care about it. And yeah, Hong Jun, the point probably is a. Uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think Jiguel's question was about diversification on the bank asset side. If, if yes, yes, the bank yes. has many of these loans, then yeah, but how, size, but, but how does this thing size, aggregate up? I think that that's the question. Size, right? yeah, yes, yes, yeah. Hong Jun mentioned that too, right? When you mentioned about the systematic thing about if we, we yeah, so it's about, Yitai may about want to say something. <laughs> what do you want to say something? No, no, <laughs> uh, no, no I, I was saying, I, I think those are slightly different questions. I think uh, Hong Jun was asking more about do depositors even uh, look at information, and I think the Jigo accepts that they do, but but he's, he's asking more about size. Uh, you know, if, if size. the bank is making many loans, then how does this mechanism? translate into a situation where the bank is making many of these loans. That, that, that was my, I, I think, I, I think it's in, it would be uh, interesting to think about the model uh, in, in that light, uh, sort of think about multiple assets that, that the bank holds. Yeah, and here we implicitly assume it's a systematic here. We implicitly assume. Right. Because it's, it's, about, it's about the financial stability. It's about what the uh, worried uh, kind of government implicitly is a systematic risk. I guess maybe that's why Zigo mentioned diversification, right? When the small loans, when you aggregate them together, maybe what is left out is the systematic part. Yeah, the size and the systematic, yes. Yeah. yeah. Related, in, the, in the Canada report or whatever you, you know, I did I never, but I'm very interested in knowing in their vision that uh, what would be the funding side of. Yeah, they didn't, it didn't, they, they, they released a report in 2019 and asked people to comment on that. This kind of three questions they asked. It's three oh, oh, basic questions. Okay. Yeah. Good, good. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And then they have a summary. They have a long term, about uh, 50 pages of summary. And uh, so they, they mentioned in 2020. And they may summarize the mission kind of like a privacy, consumer protection, cybersecurity, and also about the financial stability. This is kind of the main concern. And the Bank of Canada also has some follow up. They also discuss about the financial stability. But the financial stability itself is a kind of a very elusive concept. It's a kind of probably in different contexts, you have different meanings. And so we, we just take a particular view, thinking about the financial stability as a efficient resource allocation, and then we move on. So that's a, yeah, uh, as I said, the bank, the, the this two sides of information based, uh, yeah. the, like asset liability. I am working more on the macro finance side, where we took a lot of reduced from assumptions to make both sides work. Uh, but uh, this is the paper where you know take seriously about the information both sides. I, I, that's why I said that I I like the thank you direction. thanks. Thanks. We, yeah, we also responded to your, your earlier comments with the Jidong about the symmetric, asymmetric equilibrium. Indeed, we oh, found a very <laughs> weird asymmetric equilibrium. It looks very, uh, very weird. It's a unique, very weird. 
I'm gonna read it, read it in detail. This one, yeah. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Professor Yang. Uh, yeah, Yangji. Uh, it's a related question, uh, but uh, uh, a little bit big picture question. So if we think about this uh, informational rule of banks, uh, there's one argument, for example, by Holmstrom say, saying that banking as a secret keeper. So basically they play a safe gate between investors and those borrowers to keep the, the, the accurate uh, way of how the risk, risk level of the, their their loans as a secret in in, pro, in return they provide some liquidity asset so the spirit of this whole open banking seems like play and goes into an opposite direction of that i i yeah. just wondering like uh, how we understand banks it's more like a normative question rather than a positive question yes yeah here yeah here the it gave that data to people, to consumers. Um, they, I, I don't have a good answer to that. It's, just, it's like, uh, I think the concern is, is different. The concern here, the, the starting point is uh, they think the current system, the banks are, have too much monopoly power. They want to create a more competition among banking system. I think about the open banking in a good way. Uh, so what you mentioned, probably that some potential kind of upside of, of banks. And that's not under the consideration. The, the initial kind of motivation is to create a competition. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, increase the voter welfare and the concern about some hidden risk. And we just want, now we just want to understand what the hidden risk is. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Sarah, can I ask one more question? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how important the, the heterogeneity uh, between banks. So if the bank, different banks have a very different ability in extracting signals uh, from the raw data, and then and then that will change the, your results. I'm not sure to what extent. So because if the current bank, like information monopoly, tends to be a larger bank, which have a lot of IT stuff, have a better algorithms, and then even if you open up this uh, data thing, they still have this comparative advantage in, in doing so. So yeah, now they, they are they, they, they are having different signals. I think that's the key. They yeah. are having they are having different signals. So the, uh, they even they have the same data. They have a conditionally independent signal. They don't have the common signal. So they, if they have a common signal, then no vendors curse. So they have the same signal and uh, different signals. That's uh, I think that's driving the result. Probably what you have in mind is uh, yeah, uh, even if they have different signals, their precision can be also different precision levels. Yeah. I think that one is uh, the paper is emphasized by by the by by Zhi Guojing and the Jidong's paper. The fintech firms have a more precise signal that drive their result. The signing up people will will suffer because you you have a kind of weaker comp competition actually because you have a fintech guy. Accessing the signal, the signal is more precise. That that guy becomes a monopoly, sort of like that. That that weaker competition will drive down the the welfare of of people who opt in to sign up. Yeah. So here yeah. We, we we treat them symmetrically. We just think about these two firms symmetric, uh, two two banks, and the, but the signals are definitely different. If the signals are identical, the result will be gone. That a new vendor occurs. So the, the 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 signal is conditional on the state independent and the precision level the same, both given by pi. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, Professor Shumio. Yeah. yeah, I think one interesting interpretation of this assumption of the information generation is that maybe when the two banks uh, are merged as one, then the welfare will improve. Because they, they the, basically uh -huh. generate two independent signals, right? So they yeah, can yeah. have the information. From the, it. Yeah, that will work against the open banking idea, right? It's like if you have two banks migrate to one, it's like a bank one has a more precise signal that you, you increase the pi probably from 0.5, 0.6 to 0.8, something like this. Yeah, that, yeah but, but that, that's still that, uh, I think that will, that will not change the overall the, I'm not sure whether that will change the overall welfare, but that will still keep the borrowers uh, 
very miserable. Borrowers still have zero. Yeah, that's true. So the bank yeah. can uh, can uh, still capture even more rent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but but that, that will uh, work against the, the, the initiative. The initiative will try to create the competition. So now you you let, let them merge. Uh, that I don't think that the, the government, the regulator, will try to pursue that direction. Yes, I just think the assumption is quite interesting, and uh, uh, it can have some other implications. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Any more questions for Professor Yang? Okay, so then I guess we can conclude here. Thanks again, Professor Yang. It's a really interesting talk. We learned a lot. So hope to see you soon in our upcoming webinars. And also thank everyone for participation. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much for the great comments. Thank you. Thank you, Hongjin. Right. Thank you, Zhiguo. Yeah.